Well, I was born and raised in Blue Island, Illinois, which is a suburb of Chicago. Um, went to, you know, grade school, high school there, and uh, had a pretty normal childhood, I guess. Uh, I think I was happy I was a kid then than being a kid now, because I think life was a little more uncomplicated. When I graduated from high school, I was only 16 years old. I had started when I was five and I skipped third grade. Well, I thought, well, I really can't go out and get a job. I mean, uh, and a bunch of my school chums had uh, said, well, why don't we join the National Guard? And there's a, a National Guard unit, 124th Field Artillery, uh, in the, on the south side of Chicago, and we'll join the Guard, and then we know what we'll be in. Uh, they're not just going to put us in the infantry or whatever. We figured we we're just going to have to serve a year, and then we'd get out and have our year done. Well, that was all fine and dandy, except Pearl Harbor came along. Well, my Uncle Jack and I have talked about um, some of his World War II experiences from time to time over the years. Uh, and I finally, uh, I always thought that he was on a B-29 and he'd always correct me. <laughs> finally, I got it right that he was on a B-17 in World War II. And uh, I was talking to some of my pals, uh, Gary Weaver. Gary Sinise, a, a venerable actor and director, uh, has been a friend of the DAV since 1994. Uh, his performance in the movie Forrest Gump, uh, his character as Lieutenant Dan Taylor, everyone who saw that film reacted in a way that we reacted, saying, my goodness, what a wonderful portrayal, what an honest portrayal of a, a severely injured, a catastrophically injured veteran who served his country. And I started talking to Gary over breakfast about uh, our air show program, hoping to entice him perhaps to come to one of the shows and see what goes on get him interested in the program. He said, Gary, you've got a, you got a B-25, that's wonderful, but you know, you know anyone who has a B-17 or access to a B-17? And I said, well, as a matter of fact, I do, uh, believe it or not. He, he looked at me and, and wondered if I was just kidding with him. And then he went on to say, my uncle, my uncle Jack, was a navigator on a B-17 during the war. And uh, he flew 30 missions, survived those 30 missions, obviously. You think it would ever be possible that I could get him a ride on a, on a B-17? So I told my dad what I was planning to do. Once, once I knew that Gary could make it happen, we could figure out a date and everything. Then I told my dad, I said, Dad, here's what uh, I'm trying to work out for Uncle Jack. And my, my mom and dad, you know, just, you know, you know, were shocked and, you know, blown away by that. And I said, but we got to keep it a secret. Well, as I said to Uncle Jack, I said, you know, okay, June 23rd, you're going to Texas. And he just looked at me, and I, and I told my mom and dad, and he just looked at me, and he goes, oh, oh, well, I'll have to see if I can figure that out and find, a, you know, I might have something going on. I said, no, you don't have anything going on. You're going to Texas on June, June 23rd for, for the weekend, or the June 24th. And so I told him that my band was going to play down here, and, you know, I wanted him to come and experience the concert. And, well, we fooled him as long as we could. <laughs> the whole world benefited from this extraordinary generation of Uncle Jacks. Their life arc includes overcoming the Great Depression, fighting and winning the biggest, deadliest war in human history, and creating an age of economic prosperity and technological advancement which may never be equaled. Yet, they rarely talk about any of it. To me, he's always been just my Uncle Jack. It wasn't until I became active in veterans' causes that I really started thinking about what he'd done. 
what he'd been through. And I think my first mission was in, into France. Um, and it's like, uh, it's like uh, being at a movie. I mean, you're so new to all this and you, uh, you know, plane takes off and you get in your group and, and next thing you know, you're going over the English coast and now you're going over the uh, French coast and uh, you see a little flack over here. And it, I'd say for about the first five missions, it's just like, well, boy, isn't this something? Nothing's happened to you yet, and you're seeing, you see, you see some planes get shot down, but it doesn't, it, it doesn't sink in yet. Well, we anyway, we went to Leipzig. Now it always kind of amazed me every time I saw this. As far as you could see in front of you, there were airplanes. As far as you could see back of you, there were airplanes. So we were on the bomb run, and we get hit. The one engine goes out and with that we we lose a little power and I'm in the lead ship and we start to go down a little bit. Well then the group follows us. So we go to the secondary. They're still following us and we're trying to maintain altitude but we just barely got to this airfield and we dropped our bombs but now we lost another engine. And about that time, the gas starts streaming out from under the wing, just a big stream. Well, we knew we were in trouble then. Well, so the group, they, they just keep on flying. They're going back. We're all by ourselves. And we said, well, we'll just keep going. And we'll go back as far as we can. If we have to bail out or if the plane catches on fire, well, then we'll, we'll bail out. So we just kept going and going. We kept going down, down, just slowly. Now we only got about two and a half engines because uh, the other ones weren't working. And we just kept going and going. And pretty soon we uh, pick up some fighters, a uh, couple of P-38s that looked very nice sitting out here like that. Then we picked up some P-47s and they'd you know, pick us up along the way. So that was kind of nice because we're all by ourselves. So we finally get to the coast, but by this time we're down about 700 feet. And we didn't know whether we we're gonna have to ditch or what. So we, we knew, and we're practically out of gas. So we did land on the, on the, in England at a RAF base. We did get that, we got back that far. And uh, so uh, they, they, came, they came and got us then. But uh, the plane was pretty well shot up. We told Uncle Jack that we were recording his remembrances for an oral history project. At this point, he was still not aware of the surprise that awaited him. Okay. You guys wouldn't tell me what this is all about. Well, look what we have right in here. <laughs> you were a navigator, correct? Right. Well, we're getting ready to go fly, and, and our navigator called in sick today, so well, you, would you do us the honor of going flying with us today? You what, you, you're going to actually go flying? If you'll go. Well, sure I'll go. Well. <laughs> Gary, would you like to go along? I'll go. <laughs> you yes. want to go on a ride? Sure I do.
But I wanted to be right with Uncle Jack to sort of experience, you know, his first time in the plane and, and be there when we took off. And uh, just watching his, his face was pretty, pretty awesome. You know, it just, it made me think, you know, what must it be like for him to be actually taken off in this plane again? But I'd say, well, here we go. And then that was the first time. Then after that, it was here we go again. And yesterday, it seemed like we <laughs> took off. In my mind, I was saying, here we go again. Let me tell you about going back home. After, after your missions, I, you got orders to, to go back to the States and came in to New York Harbor. And I will have to say, when you see Statue of Liberty, as you're going by it, and that was just something else. I mean, you just can't, you just can't believe that now you're home, at least up to that point, but that was a sight that you never forget. In a, in a sense, it was kind of overwhelming. I mean, I don't, I had no idea that I would ever do anything like that again. And when we opened the door, and I, then I'm actually standing there, I, it was kind of a wow. I, I, I did see an, I did see a B-17, and, but I. <laughs> I was just, you know, surprised. There, it, there it sat, and uh, it, 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 it was, a, it was a surprise. I, I will say. After doing his duty and surviving the war, like millions of other veterans, Jack settled back into life in his hometown. 
He went to college and earned a degree from Northwestern University. He married a hometown girl and raised four children. They remained married for 50 years until her recent passing. He went to work for the hometown bank and remained there for 32 years. I, I, I like what you're doing, is to preserve this, because it's true otherwise, it's just like some of the things I'm gonna show you. They get put in the trunk and forgotten. Not if we can help it, Uncle Jack. Not if we can help it. You cannot place statues or build memorials in thin air. These airplanes, rescued, restored, returned to the sky, are the memorials. Through them, we give enduring thanks to those who gave everything they had to defend everything that we hold dear. By sharing them, we remind each other of the sacrifice. By sharing them, we introduce our heirs to their heritage. One week each summer, these national treasures are flown here. Twice each day, those who restored them present them to those who risk their lives to fight in them. And those who really did it tell the rest of us how it really was. It is a singular series of history lessons that anyone who cherishes liberty ought to see. Gary Sinise is known to most of us as Lieutenant Dan, the character he played in the Oscar-winning movie Forrest Gump, and as Mac Taylor, the lead character in the long-running TV series CSI New York. He is equally well known for his tireless support of our troops, veterans, and first responders. The tradition of service to our country runs long and deep in Gary's family. His uncle, Jack Sinise, flew 30 missions as a lead navigator in World War II. Gary's brother-in-law and close friend, Jack Treese, served 23 years in the U.S. Army, earning two bronze stars and two purple hearts. Jack served in Vietnam as a combat medic with the 101st Airborne Division. 
Sadly, both Jack Sinise and Jack Treese passed away this past October. General Patrick Brady knows firsthand the heroism of combat medics like Jack Trees. During two tours of duty as a medevac pilot in Vietnam, he flew more than 2,000 missions and rescued more than 5,000 wounded. For evacuating 51 wounded while having three helicopters shot out from under him on January 6, 1968, he was presented the Medal of Honor. In one of the most inspirational of all Warbirds in Review forums, General Brady and Gary Sinise will pay tribute to Jack Sinise, Jack Treese, and indeed all those veterans who risked all to defend us and to save their brothers and sisters in the field while the battle still raged. Providing a fitting backdrop for this presentation will be the Yankee Air Force's beautifully restored Yankee Lady, a B-17 much like the one in which Jack Sinise flew his 30 wartime missions. Thank you. It is such a privilege to be here to share with all of you um, uh, in honoring our veterans who have protected our freedoms for decades, our, our active duty personnel, and our civilians who restore these airplanes because they're committed to maintaining this history. We don't want any of us to be forgotten. So it's a privilege to be with you today. Thanks for joining us. Um, Gary Sinise, uh, uh, an Emmy, a uh, Golden Globe uh, nomination for an Oscar, just a few of his many professional uh, honors. Uh, of course, his Lieutenant Dan Band continues to make us uh, tap our feet and get up and dance in the aisles. Uh, Gary, with his long commitment to honoring veterans, uh, created his foundation, the Gary Sinise Foundation. His foundation serves our nation and honors our defenders our veterans, our first responders, there's families, in fact, anybody in need. He is national spokesperson for the American Veterans Disabled for Life Memorial and the recipient of the Presidential Citizen Medal for his humanitarian work supporting Iraqi children. Welcome, Gary Sinise. Thank you, bud. Thank you. Now welcome Medal of Honor recipient, General Patrick Brady. <laughs> Gary, tell us about Jack Treese, your, your brother-in-law. How close were you to him? Well, Jack, uh, Jack was more like uh, a brother to me. I met Jack uh, back in the early 80s through my wife. Uh, uh, he married my wife's sister. They met at Fort Stewart when they were both at Fort Stewart. Jack, uh, as they said in this uh, video, is a combat medic in Vietnam, and he stayed in the service for 22 years. He, he um, met my wife down, uh, my wife's sister down at Fort Stewart. And we became very, very close, very good friends. Um, I ended up, uh, when I started uh, taking USO tours and going overseas and visiting our troops in Iraq and Afghanistan, I would take Jack with me because uh, obviously he was uh, somebody who would really appreciate getting to, uh, to see our, our service members uh, in the, the current conflict. And I knew he would enjoy uh, being there, and, and it would be something that I could give back to him. So we were very, very close. Uh, unfortunately, he uh, was diagnosed with cancer in April of last year, and he died in October. It went very, very quickly. But uh, I learned a lot from him about service and uh, 
the Army, Vietnam, and a little bit about what it was like for him to be in service as a combat medic, although I'm probably going to learn a lot more today from General Bra Brady because my, my brother-in-law, he didn't talk a whole lot about it, but uh, um, I knew there was a lot going on in him, and I miss him very much. General Brady, um, talk about your crew. When you got a call to go out to evacuate people, what's the, who's the crew? Well, how's it made up? The, the crew on a dust-off helicopter was uh, four people. Pilot, co-pilot, medic, and a crew chief. And it was a very, very tight-knit tight -knit, uh, team. We had to work together in all kinds of terrain and everything. I feel, I feel like I know Jack, too. He, he was in Vietnam the same time I was. We were there. Uh, of course, you all remember Bob Hope and what he did for the troops when he came to Vietnam. I can't tell you what that meant to me and to the troops that I served with. And this next to me, Gary Sinise, is the Bob Hope of today. And what he does for those troops is just wonderful. Now, <clears throat> Jack was a medic. He was a combat medic. And the combat medic on our aircraft saw more traumatic amputations, sucking chest wounds, belly wounds, uh, probably than a lot of physicians. Then they were very good in a very rough environment of uh, saving those lives. I, I'll just tell you uh, a vignette or two about a couple of the guys who did the same kinds of things. By the way, uh, uh, Jack died on my birthday last year, the 1st of October, and he was in my, the same battalion that I would later command in the 101st 326 Med Battalion when they were in Vietnam, so I do feel close to this kid. I had a medic, his name was Steve Hook, to give you an idea of a typical thing that a medic does in combat. We were called into an area, it was supposed to be secure. You got some veterans Vietnam guys here? You know, you know what a secure area was? They would say, dust off, come on in, it's secure. <laughs> and so we get in there and uh, hit the ground and two uh, people popped out of spider, spider nest right beside the aircraft, shot my crew chief, shot my medic, Steve Hook. The crew chief was hanging in his harness, I thought he was dead. Hook, the medic, disappeared. And the guys on the ground went to, busy, went to work killing the, the snipers uh, that were right there next to us. And I'm looking for Hook. And uh, they said, get the hell out of here. So there was a kind of a little keyhole. So I pushed the aircraft forward into the keyhole. And there were 11 wounded. And I look around, and there's Hook, my medic, who shot, dragging the wounded to the aircraft. A lot of the, a lot of the friendlies wouldn't stand up to help him, and he's dragging 11 people onto the aircraft. He gets on, we're heavily loaded, and I look around, trying to get it out of that area, I look around, <clears throat> and Hook is going through the bodies in the back of the helicopter, treating him, but he's bleeding. He's shot in the back and he's bleeding, and I'm afraid he's gonna bleed out. So I grab one of the wounded, I'm trying to fly the aircraft with one hand, my co-pilot was having some problems, and shake one of the wounded guys and point to his first aid packet and say, and then point to the hole in Hook's back and say, plug it up. And so he's plugging up Hook while Hook is taking care of the, the patients. Now that's one example of what his brother-in-law went through on a daily basis in Vietnam. And I can tell you many, more, many, many stories about these were my favorite human beings. The, the crew chief and the medic in Vietnam who was part of the team that we had that saved literally one million souls just in Vietnam alone. So he was a great, he, I know, I feel like I know him. I know he was a great person. I would have loved to meet him in person. You were obviously honored, uh, you know, when President Nixon bestowed the medal on you. What does that mean to you, reflecting on what you're describing right now? Well, you know, I was, I was actually embarrassed when I, you stand up there, there's people on the White House lawn, and, and you know very well that guys like Jack and guys like Hook 
and Pappy Coleman and the guys that flew with me, you know very, very well that they did everything that you did and nobody saw it. And it's just that simple. The greatest thing about that award is that a bunch of your buddies saw it, uh, appreciated it, and took the time to put you in for it. And so that, you know, you wear that for them. That's, you know, that sounds trite, but it's absolutely true. Guy says, I'm doing my duty. All I'm doing is, that's absolutely true. Except on some occasions, somebody will see what you've done and will appreciate it and will take the time to write it up. And that's, that's how I got the Medal of Honor. Describe, uh, once you go in once and you see what's on the ground, whether it's mines and it's explosions and you're getting shot at, and they have to crawl out of the medics, have to crawl out of the helicopter and do what you describe, well, fine, maybe the first time, but when the bell rings the next time, what does it take to do it six, eight, ten times a day, day after day, week after week? Yeah, that's a trick. The, the uh, guys will, will oftentimes be very, very gung-ho the first time in, and then the next time after they see what they've seen, you might have some problems. But we never had that problem with our medics and with our crew chiefs on the helicopters. These guys were saving lives. And, and you know, they would say, okay, <clears throat> we went in, the aircraft went in, he got shot up, uh, left, and then dust off went in after the other aircraft got, got shot up and got the patients out. Big deal. Well, guess what? The second mouse gets the cheese. And it's just that simple. The guys that would be shooting, by the time we got there, it was not that bad. We were able to go in using different flying techniques and be pretty secure about what we did. But the key, the key to the kind of people that we had with, there's no experience in the world that can match the experience of saving another human being's life. Nothing like it. I had an experience when I was a young kid uh, swimming and another thing and geez it just I just felt so good about it in Vietnam we did that day in and day out saving lives and so these guys like Jack Treese and the Hook and Coleman and these guys they were up every morning eager to go out and to rescue those people to overcome the obstacles to get around the enemy to to, to, to get in that terrain or the weather or whatever the problem was and to get that guy out and get him into a hospital where the, where the physician saved his life. That was, that was the fact. Where, where <clears throat> does the word fear come into any of this conversation? Oh God. Fear is a horrible thing. But you, what you have to do is fear will cause to happen that which caused it. Just think about that. You didn't want to do My faith was a substitute for fear. I'm a Catholic. Uh, I was never afraid in combat. The, 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 the system that I used to get the Medal of Honor was the system the good Lord showed me, flying in zero, zero weather in day. And the system I used to get the Distinguished Service Cross was a system that the good Lord showed me at night, flying in weather as well. Fear is an emotion. Courage is a decision. Big difference between a guy who reacts under the emotion of fear when his life is on the line and the, li and the lives of the people around him are on the line, he is in, in a reaction mode. The guys like Jack Treese and Steve and the, guy, the guys that flew with me, that was a decision. They knew what they were going into. That is real courage when they will do that day in and day out. When you came back, you know, after your second tour, and Jack, you know, came back obviously around the same time, how were you received when you got back? Well, uh, it, you know, the, Viet the, the good thing about what happened to us in Vietnam is that America was kind of ashamed of the way they treated us, and they're treating the guy today uh, so much better. And you got guys like Gary going to take care of these kids. You got so many people who care about it. Now, having said that, the VA is not doing a very good job taking care of these guys. And you guys, and I'm going to tell the group, this, you need to get off your ass and get out and find people and elect people who are going to take care of this guy when he comes home. And that ain't enough. You got to take care of your buddy who is a veteran. <laughs> uh, 
And I told uh, David and anybody who would listen to me, uh, my daughter was in the invasion of Iraq. She was a second lieutenant, she was a medic just like I was. I've been almost dead a bunch of times, but I never went through what I went through when my little baby girl is in that invasion. I'm hearing through the media that they're being overrun, they're out of ammo, ambushed, all that bullshit until I could finally get to a, a television station that told me the truth, but I never went through anything like I went through. And so that, to me, said, my God, my wife, the families of all the veterans who were over there, just think what they went through. We didn't think about it when we were over there. The guys never thought about it. We never worried about it. But when I saw my little girl go, that, was, that brought home to me. So the other thing besides taking care of your buddies is taking care of those families as well. They sacrificed their youth so that liberty might grow old. And they've got widows and they've got people uh, that need our help. And as I said, we've been honored to death, for God's sakes. We need to take care of those like us who need our help and their families. You know, when so many of you came back and, and, and the media was on this, of course, like a hawk uh, during the Vietnam War, and calling the returning soldiers and airmen baby killers. What, what could you possibly say back to that if you heard that? Well, here's the way I looked at it. I, I didn't believe that was the American people speaking. I believe that was the media. And you don't want to get me started on the media. But I do believe, yeah, they, you know, they're supposed to tell us the truth about ourselves. They don't do that. They're so essential to our freedom and they just don't really do their job. But I felt like what went on when we came back from Vietnam was a product of the media. We, we didn't, today the, the kids that go out and they're, they're welcomed and, and idolized, we kind of went underground, we went back to our jobs. We, I stayed in the military and, uh, and uh, although I hated it when I went in, I didn't want nothing to do with it, but it was the best thing that ever happened to me. So I, I think the American people appreciate the Vietnam veteran, and I know today, because of the way they treated us, I feel this sincerely, that they are treating this guy in a way that they will never be, will never be confused with the way they treated us in Vietnam. Yeah. Gary, as, as you listen to this, I'm thinking you've put your money where your mouth is. General Brady just said to all of us, we've got a job to do, to become part of solutions, not continue to be part of the problem through not doing anything. You're doing it with your foundation. Tell me about the foundation, how you formed it, and, and what you're doing with it. Well, it, it's, a, you know, it's an honor to be here with my friend uh, General Brady here. Um, I am very much motivated um, by what you just said, Pat, which is the Vietnam veterans in my family are the ones that really opened my eyes back as a young man. Now, I have veterans on my side of the family. My Uncle Jack, World War II, and my, uh, my Uncle Jerry was uh, on a ship in the Pacific in World War II. My dad was in the Navy. My grandfather was a, uh, he was an ambulance driver in France in World War I. But on my wife's side of the family, it was the Vietnam veterans who were just a little bit older than I when I graduated from high school and who I met um, because of my wife who really opened my eyes and educated me quite a bit to what, our, what guys just a little bit older than I were going through when I was uh, kind of uh, diddly bopping around and uh, playing guitar and, and uh, chasing girls and things like that in high school. So when, when that happened, when I got this education from meeting her brothers and Jack Treese, uh, her sister's husband, uh, a lot changed for me. And so I became very involved uh, early on uh, in the late 70s and 80s. Whoa! Sound of, Sound of freedom. That's it. <laughs> So in the uh, late 70s and early 80s, I just got a real awakening there. Uh, the sound of freedom is still going on, isn't it? And that's great. And um, 
And I got very involved with uh, locally in, in the Chicago area with uh, local Vietnam veterans groups and worked with them from early 80s up until the mid 90s and then I played a Vietnam veteran in uh, Forrest Gump so I was I was I felt very prepared just very motivated when I got that part to to honor our Vietnam veterans and to do right by them by playing that particular character and then through that I got involved with the disabled American veterans because I played an injured veteran and I was introduced to the DAV and that's that's big reason why I'm here today they sponsor these concerts that I do and I've been involved with them since uh, 1994 and then after September 11th when we deployed to Afghanistan and Iraq it felt that there was a a, a, a purpose for me uh, beyond staying home and so I volunteered for the USO and got very involved with that and a lot of different military charities that were popping up in reaction to the attacks on September 11th and then that manifested itself into my uh, own foundation the Gary Sinise Foundation and whose whole purpose is to serve and honor the needs of our military men and women our first responders those who protect and defend and provide our security and freedom for us and those in need and that's what the Gary Sinise Foundation is trying to do all around the country So on a day-to-day -day basis, where, where, where do these commitments take you and the people who work with you? I mean, physically, where do you go? Uh, I'm, I'm constantly traveling. Uh, today I'm doing this veteran support concert here. Uh, last week I was somewhere, and the week before I was somewhere else. Um, so uh, we're doing quite a bit. You can learn about the foundation at GarySiniseFoundation.org. But one of the great things that has happened through the course of this post 9-11 uh, reaction and response is that I was connected with our Medal of Honor recipients and the Medal of Honor Foundation and I'm on the President's Advisory Group for the Medal of Honor Foundation and I have since become a national spokesperson for the Medal of Honor Museum that we're going to build in Mount Pleasant, South Carolina. So I want to encourage everybody to go to Medal of Honor Museum uh, dot org. It's the, it's the Medal of Honor Museum website. It'll completely key you in to what we're going. I think General, General Brady yeah. would probably want to talk a little bit about exactly. that. Exactly. General, tell yeah. us about the, it yeah, and why uh, it's important. You know, they uh, they say that every so-called hero must at last become a bore. So all of those of us who are in the Medal of Honor Society, in order to keep from becoming bores, have decided to do something. In the old days, when we had when we had conventions, uh, you would go there and we would party. And when you party with guys like Pappy Boynton, Commando Kelly, Scooter Burke, these are world-class partiers. <laughs> and we decided that, and Chief Childress, my God. I partied with him one night and I don't remember it. But we, we went to Philadelphia one time. And uh, the mayor there, Mayor Rendell, says, would you guys in the Medal of Honor Society, we have a convention in some city around the United States every year, would you go on a drug walk with us? Well, we didn't know what a drug walk was, but we walked through these urban or suburban or whatever, these neighborhoods, these downtrodden neighborhoods at night to show the drug dealers, I guess, that the mayor was there and that the Medal of Honor recipients were with him. And so the next day they said, well, why don't you go to a school? So we did. We went to a high school in Philadelphia and we had to go through metal detectors. And we thought, good Lord, you know, we have got to leave something behind besides a hangover. When we leave from now on and go to a place, we're going to do something else. So we developed our character development program Gary's been instrumental on that. He's in our board. This is the, probably the finest, the most powerful board in the world. The, no, the people who are on that board are world-class American citizens who have created thousands and thousands of jobs and done great things for this country. And so through our character development program, we go into the schools across America and we teach children the importance of courage, source of success, sacrifice, a source of happiness, what a hero is, have to be a good person to be a hero, and what a what a, what a America's nobility is and patriotism. And we use me Medal of Honor vignettes to bring out these different points. And they're online, they're free, 
and you can get to them anytime you want. But the ultimate, the ultimate end of all this, we're going to die. We're, we're, the average age of the Medal of Honor guy is 75 or something. We're going to be dead in five or six years, almost all of us. There was 400 of them when I came in. Now there's about 79 of us left. We've got some young guys, but not enough. So this museum is going to be a vault for our values. This museum is different than any other museum in America. It's not about a war, it's not about an army service, it's not about infantry armor, it's about all those things as represented by Medal of Honor recipients and the values that that medal represents. Medal, this medal, the other half token of this medal is courage, sacrifice, patriotism. That's going to be in that museum. And so that when a young man walks in the front of that museum and sees that Medal of Honor recipients, not only what they did in combat, but one of them's on Mount Rushmore. One of them was the first guy to fly with a gyro that opened up the airways for all the rest of us. This guy wrote taps. They did other things. And young people can do those same things in their life. They can be heroes in their life. And this is what we want, want them to take away. You go through this museum, one person, you come out the other end, a different person. Every one of us in our lifetime has met someone, somewhere, who made a difference in our life and made us what we are today. For me, it was the Christian Brothers of Ireland who just beat the shit out of me. <laughs> and they finally straightened me out. But somewhere, somehow, somebody is going to make, and we hope that we, through our museum and through, we couldn't do it without guys like Gary. And uh, that's the end. That's my, that's my bucket list. And, uh, and if I die at the dedication of the museum, I'll be, I'll be happy. There are now a number of, you know. <laughs> yeah. um, there are now a number of young Medal of Honor recipients from Iraq and Afghanistan. What is their effect when you go around the country and appear publicly with these young men? What, what's the effect of them compared to, say, you? Yeah, they, they, the young people don't want to hear a lot from me. Yeah, I, 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 I'm too much like their parents and grandparents. But the, the young kids that are coming into the society now, and I think there's only five or six, I haven't met them all. But the ones I've been with are real high quality kids. And they are so important because a young person can communicate with them. I don't understand what's going on with these young people today, hardly, but they do. And so they can communicate with them. They know the technology. They understand what's going on in their minds and hearts and all that. So these young people are going to be jewels for the future of our character development program and our museum. And uh, so we're breaking them in. We're breaking them in. And, uh, and we're hoping that they follow in our footsteps. Gary, when you listen to uh, Pat talk about Jack Treese, your brother-in-law, and what he did, and you hear the details, how much of those details had you ever heard from Jack? Well, just just very few, actually. You know, uh, I would try to get him to talk about it, and he would always be very sort of matter-of-fact about it. You know, uh, and then you know, but I've I've read about some of the things that he's done. And uh, I know that he did a lot more than he was willing to kind of share. But he has, uh, you know, he and his, his wife, my wife's uh, sister, had a son. His name's Gavin Treese. He's serving in the Army. He's done two tours in Afghanistan. Uh, and, and he's carrying on the tradition in the family as uh, somebody who's serving, serving in this current, current conflict. Uh, Jack was very proud of his son, I know. Uh, he was a quiet man, very reserved, and uh, I, I, you know, I, I wish I'd recorded him. Um, we have a wonderful um, program at the National World War II Museum in, in New Orleans that my foundation is helping to sponsor because we're losing so many of those veterans. And we're sponsoring a historian to go out around the country and record oral histories of our World War II veterans. And, uh, you know, I'm doing that quite a bit, as we did with my Uncle Jack. And I just wished that I'd sat down with my brother-in-law and talked to him more and gotten him to speak about it more. You talk about carrying on the family tradition. There was your Uncle Jack. 
uh, flying B-17s as a navigator. How much did he talk? How much did he share? Well, he, he, he wouldn't be quiet. I could <laughs> 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 no, Uncle Jack, you know, I never, as a young man, it was really the Vietnam veteran side of my family that got me to kind of start thinking a lot about our veterans because by the time I was old enough, my Uncle Jack, my Uncle Jerry, my dad, my grandfather, they were all well beyond their service years and so they didn't, you know, they didn't talk about it all that much. But after I started getting involved a lot with uh, military charities and USO and all of that, I just grabbed my Uncle Jack and made him go different places with me, like this trip uh, to, to take a ride on the B-17. Yeah, how'd you pull that. that off? How'd you surprise him? We ju I just told him I was going to play a concert in Texas and I wanted him to come. And he said, oh, okay, I'll come. And um, then we, we really shocked him with the, it was all about getting him down there so we could give him a ride on a B-17. And that happened all through my contacts and friends at the DAV, Disabled American Veterans, who did that for my Uncle Jack and John Tennyson, who made this lovely film about him. And then just many, many times after that, I would take Uncle Jack, like I brought him here to Oshkosh. I, I took him to DC quite a bit to the National Memorial Day concert that I'm the co-host of every year. Uh, he got to, to come to that concert quite a bit. I would take him to the Medal of Honor events that we did at the Reagan Library out in, in Simi Valley. And he would just participate in a lot of things. And he looked so forward to traveling quite a bit. He traveled all the way up till he was 89 years old. The last trip he made was to Disney World uh, where I narrate a show down there and all he wanted and we got him there on his birthday which was uh, November 27th and all he wanted was a picture of Mickey and Minnie <laughs> with him. That's what he wanted for his birthday and I had a friend of mine who worked there so I said can you get me a picture with Mickey and Minnie and he said okay show up here at 2.30 so we went and showed up at 2.30 at this little place. We went backstage and the entire cast, 90 people from the parade, were all dressed up in their costumes and everything and with a big sign, happy 90th birthday, Uncle Jack. And we went in there and uh, gave him a great time. And he, he had his picture, not only with Mickey and Minnie, but with the entire cast. And he died the following year. So he had 89 great years and a lot of fun on his last trip. Pat, the, um, it, we're talking about many veterans being unable to talk about their experiences. How useful is it to get all these messages out for veterans to try to talk more about their experiences to yeah. make more people aware? You know, uh, first of all, you, you guys all know I'm a helicopter pilot, right? In honor of Jack Sinise, I wore a fixed wing. The fixed wing weenies don't fly. We know that. They ride. You only really fly a helicopter. Both arms, both legs. So in honor of him, I wore this thing. And, uh, but my dad was a, a veteran. Uh, he was uh, with Darby's Rangers in World War II. And here, here's my take on it. I think that and we started a program up in Washington State at a veteran's hospital there where we call it a partners program. And we would bring young people in from the schools and the veterans are in the beds there. And the, the kids would go into the room and talk to the veterans about their experiences. I wish that I had talked to my father about Darby's Rangers, North Africa, Sicily, Italy, but frankly, I didn't want anything to do with the military or nothing about it. And so, it, you know, it's like the guy said, we amputate our mem memories, we don't talk to each other about ourselves or our past. We need to do that. And my, my experience has been that these, these veterans are happy to share their experiences if somebody will just ask them. Just go up to your grandfather or your father who and say, hey, Dad, uh, how, what was it like there in North Africa? Uh, did you go up against Rommel? How about Sicily? How about Italy? And so he, the stories that I heard him tell were just jokes, you know, just robbing a bank so he could buy some oranges or something in Italy. But they are happy, and my, I believe that. There's nothing anybody does that there's to be why There's nothing to be ashamed about. Nothing. Everybody has a problem with fear. But there's nothing that they, they should ever be ashamed of or afraid to talk about. Now, they see some horrible things, you know, that you really, you just can't get around that. 
But uh, you don't have to talk about that. Talk to them about the history of it. Talk to them about uh, the lessons it taught them, the brotherhood that goes on between them and their buddies. There's no closer relationship. I'm sorry, Nancy. That's my wife. She's back there. But there's no closer relationship, really, than what goes on uh, between two between men in combat. You never, I can see a guy that we took us 38 years to find Pappy Coleman, just died recently. I walked up to him, it's like yesterday. The guy that I told you about, Hook, the, the shot in the back and the guy put the pad in it, he was, he was seriously hurt another time and, and almost a, by a, a miracle that I can't explain to this day. I found him, got him out. We see each other at least once a year, and uh, if we hadn't seen each other in 10 years, it wouldn't make any difference. It's the same feeling, and uh, one of the greatest honors of my life, really, was Pappy Coleman. This kid was shot three times, three, three Purple Hearts, three Silver Stars. He was with me on the Medal of Honor action. Uh, he was one time, he was shot right through the lips. Uh, they jumped on him and said, uh, Pappy, Pappy, he says, not to worry, I just kissed the bullet that had my name on it. Jumped up, back to get the patients in the minefield with me, his pants were on fire, he was almost blown through my rotor blades, back to get the patients, and I use him as, a, as an example of a good person. He left the Army with 18 years, 18 years, he could have been Sergeant Major of the Army to go home and take care of his family. He's a hero, not because of three silver stars, he's a hero because he's a good person. And that's what's important about heroism. But anyhow, uh, the great thrill was when he called me on his deathbed, uh, and here I am, I'm watching my beloved Spurs kick Miami's ass, and all of a sudden I get a phone call from him, he's on his deathbed and he wants me to handle his funeral. Uh, he's now in the Aviation Hall of Fame, uh, he's in the Dust Off Hall of Fame, marvelous human being. The only problem with it was they were burying him in Turkey Creek, Kentucky. They don't speak English in Turkey Creek, Kentucky. And to communicate with soldiers and to communicate with funeral people and to get bands and crap drove me nuts. But I was, I was happy to do it for Pappy, I guarantee you. So talk to him. Don't be afraid to talk to them. They're happy to, to tell you their experiences. Keep away from the, from the bad stuff, you know. Uh, I'm a guy that can't stand a needle, for God's sakes. I didn't think I would get through my first mission, but they did, I did, and uh, they're more than happy to share the, the, the experiences with you folks. Just ask them. Ladies and gentlemen, how many of you are veterans? Yeah. Uh, when this when this program saw over, over all of you veterans, we have a young woman who will have challenge coins for all of you who are veterans. Also, Gary has to leave immediately to go do sound check for his band performance for tonight. Um, and we're going to take a picture with all the volunteers, by the way, who want pictures Everybody with. The Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much, Gary Sinise and General Patrick Brady.
It's August 17th, 1943, just another day for the men of the U.S. Army Air Corps in England. Dawn breaks over the mist-shrouded countryside of East Anglia to reveal a scene of bustling activity. Ground crewmen hurry about making last-minute preparations for the day's mission. Bombs are loaded, engines are tuned, machine guns are cleaned, while every round of ammunition is checked and rechecked. In nearby Quonset huts, thousands of aviators anxiously await the start of today's briefing. Silently, they pray that they'll be given a milk run, perhaps a rail yard in France, or a German airfield in Belgium. But when their grim-faced commanders step before them, they know that today's mission will be a rough one. It was a modern marvel, armed with 13 machine guns and capable of flying 2,000 miles or more with its load of deadly explosives tucked inside its bomb bay. The world had never seen such power in an aircraft, and only the most advanced nation could have even conceived of such a destructive weapon. Each flying fortress carried aloft six miles of electrical wiring within its metal frame. Its generators could light all the rooms in a good-sized hotel. Each B-17 carried enough steel for 160 washing machines and enough aluminum for 50,000 percolators. The rubber used in its wing de-icers could retread almost a thousand automobile tires. Each B-17 cost almost a half million dollars, a huge sum for the time. The B-17 was truly an American weapon, complex, expensive, huge, larger than life and it had been built for a uniquely American role, daylight precision bombing, a role that was hoped would shorten the war by knocking out factories vital to Germany's war effort. And on this day in August of 1943, the B-17s and their crews would set out to prove that they could get the job done. Far from a milk run to France, the targets for today would be the Regensburg Messerschmitt plant and the ball bearing factories around Schweinfurt. Schweinfurt had uh, dozens and dozens of ball bearing plants and factories around the city. In fact, Schweinfurt produced between 30 and 40 percent of all the ball bearings used by Germany and its allies. So the philosophy was if you could knock out the ball bearing factories around Schweinfurt, the German army and Air Force, actually, and Navy, would grind to a halt because they wouldn't have ball bearings, which was a key component to any mechanical item. The 8th Air Force would be sticking its head right into the Tiger's jaws, and the Tiger would be waiting. With the briefing concluded, the bomber crews climb aboard trucks and jeeps for the short drive to their own flying forts. The B-17s are ready to go. The mechanics and armorers have worked through the night to make sure that every bomber is fit to fly. The plan calls for two groups of bombers to coordinate their attacks on Regensburg and Schweinfurt. The 4th Bomb Wing's 139 B-17s would go in first, hitting the Messerschmitt factory, then flying on to North Africa in an effort to confuse the German defenses. Meanwhile, close behind the 4th Bomb Wing would come the 1st Bomb Wing's 222 flying fortresses. They would sneak in behind the 4th and destroy the ball bearing factories around Schweinfurt. Bad weather ruined the plan. The Luftwaffe almost ruined the mission. 
The B-17s form up over England before heading out toward Germany. The fourth bomb wing is already 90 minutes late. They'll be lucky to reach North Africa by sundown. As the first 139 bombers cross into Belgium, the second wave of bombers still hasn't even left the ground back in East Anglia. In fact, the first bomb wing would be delayed five hours. The attackers would go in piecemeal and the Luftwaffe would tear them to pieces. The fourth bomb wing is attacked first. Scores of German Messerschmitt 109s and Focke Wolf 190s rip into the bomber formations. They concentrate on the trailing squadrons in the 15 mile long bomber stream. The Germans threw something on the order of 300 fighters at these 147 B-17s. And the low group was the most vulnerable and the 100th bomb group earned its reputation that day uh, uh, that stu has stuck with them for 60 years, 50, 60 years, um, as being known as the hard luck outfit. They called it the bloody hundred. Convinced that the B-17s will soon be turning back for England, the Luftwaffe ground controllers scramble every fighter in Northwest Europe. They're surprised when the fourth bomb wing heads south toward Africa. But they have plenty of targets anyway, for right at that moment, the Schweinfurt-bound Boeings of the first bomb wing reach the continent. They're set upon by hundreds of German fighters. The B-17s are hacked out of the sky with frightening frequency. One American gunner watches in horror as 12 bombers fall in flames around him, spilling white parachutes all over the sky. One combat wing loses a third of its plane. Entire squadrons are shot up, and only the Boeing's inherent rugged durability keeps the disaster from getting any worse. Of the 222 B-17s in the second raid, 196 reach Schweinfurt. So shot up and shocked are the crews that they scatter their bombs all over the city. The ball bearing factories are hit, but not knocked out. The area where the ball bearing industry is located was definitely for first impression, devastated. But uh, as I walked from the air base, there was no public transportation in Schweinfurt at that time, to the railroad station, I noticed that certain sections uh, of the big factory, there was still steam coming out, they were still operating, still working. Those flying forts that still remain in the formations are almost all peppered with holes. Flack has claimed a few bombers, but most have been hit or downed by aggressive fighter attacks. Just before dark, the bombers reach home. In England, the sky is filled with battered B-17s limping home. Some of the bombers reach East Anglia with one or two engines out. They crash land on any available airfield as ambulances and fire trucks race toward their shattered hulks.
Precision daylight bombing, the very reason the B-17 had been invented in the first place, had failed in the face of Germany's deadly air defenses. Still, the 8th Air Force's leadership would not give up. The bombers would soon fly again. The bloody losses over Regensburg and Schweinfurt can be traced back to the U.S. Army Air Corps' concept of strategic bombing that evolved during the 1920s. By destroying arms factories, aircraft assembly plants, ball bearing plants, and other such strategic targets, an enemy's army and air force wouldn't have the means to carry on the fight. They would be forced to surrender as their nation's wartime economy crumbled under the weight of this precision bombing campaign. It wasn't until 1935 the Americans developed a bomber capable of carrying out such a grandiose strategy. Well, B-17 was a four-engine heavy bomber designed in the mid-1930s by the Boeing Aircraft Corporation. And its primary role was to destroy enemy industrial targets through high-altitude precision bombing. And in that role, it was uniquely suited. It turned out to be one of the best aircraft probably ever built for the role that it was designed for. Mainly because First off, at high altitudes, the B-17 was an amazingly stable aircraft. Uh, the reason for that was the fact that it had a very large wing. With a, a large wing area, uh, the plane was very stable in flight. It was an excellent bombing platform. And most importantly to the crews was the fact that because it was stable, they could fly in very tight formations so they could stick together. The Boeing Model 299 prototype of the Flying Fortress flew for the first time in August of that year. It would take several more years of development before the first production models reached operational squadrons, but when they did, they were the best and most modern bombers in the world. For its time, the B-17 was huge. With its 100-foot wingspan and 70-foot length, it towered over other late 30s aircraft. Later versions, including the B-17G, came equipped with four Wright Cyclone radial engines that cranked out 5,520 total horsepower. And the fortress needed every bit of power to drag aloft its typical bomb load of 14 500-pound bombs over a distance of 3,600 miles. Top speed was about 290 miles per hour, but in tight formations and heavily loaded, the Boeing cruised at about 170. With its heavy defensive armament of 13 machine guns, the Air Corps believed that the B-17 could successfully fight off enemy interceptors without help from escorting fighters. This was a major issue as the Air Corps didn't have any fighter aircraft capable of flying long distances with the bombers. But since the Flying Fortress had so many 50 and 30 caliber machine guns, such a long-range escort fighter seemed unnecessary. The B-17s would strike their targets alone, flying in tight, mutually protecting formations. In 1943, the 8th Air Force unleashed its first sustained bombing campaign against Germany. Codenamed Operation Point Blank, the B-17s were sent to knock out the Third Reich's aircraft industry. By destroying the Luftwaffe's production centers, the 8th Air Force would gain control of the air over Europe. With that in hand, the bombers could be sent against other strategic targets, striking at the heart of the Reich's ability to wage war. Point Blank was the first clash between the American pre-war doctrine and the realities of modern air combat. The results were soon clear, but the Americans doggedly persisted in putting their theories into practice at the expense of thousands of brave young men. By the time we dropped the bombs, uh, we started getting hit real close. One engine got hit, started losing oil, 
waited until there was not enough oil pressure that they couldn't, couldn't feather the engine. So then they, they windmill just from the air and eventually they may twist the shaft off and the prop will come off. God knows where it'll go. Or they can shake a wing loose, I guess. Not a very good situation. And I don't remember if it was in that engine or another one, the uh, fire started. I don't know if they got that one out or not. And apparently the underside of the 17 was pretty well shot up, sort of dropped out of the formation and started losing altitude. And it uh, wasn't too long till the pilot rang the bailout bell. That was it, that mission. The most important flaw in the precision daylight bombing campaign was the lack of a long-range escort fighter. Even the B-17's numerous defensive guns could not protect it from determined German fighter attack. The Luftwaffe soon learned to hit the B-17 formations from the front, which proved to be the weak point in the Boeing's defensive systems. Sometimes 40 or 50 ME 109s or FW 190s would swoop down at the bombers in a blazing head on pass, aiming for the cockpit and engines. Nothing could stop such devastating attacks, and the fortresses took appalling losses. Our biggest uh, concern, really, uh, in all honesty, were the, the young men that were over there before I got there. Uh, they had a lot of fighters that they had to contend with. Uh, the uh, average mission completions that uh, they had, I think, was about seven. And here we finished 35, so that tells you something right there. If you, <clears throat> if you lost an engine, or if you feathered an engine, that was very apparent to the Germans and they'd pick on you right now. And they, they liked to make holes in the formation. If they could knock a plane out of formation, you were definitely crippled. Um, they, they knew how to do that. Without long-range fighter escorts, the 8th Air Force's B-17 groups lost 40% of their crews during 1943. Only a quarter of the bomb crews were able to fly a full tour, 25 missions, and go home that year. An average crew flew five to seven missions before getting shot down. Some who flew longer usually came home more than once with a shot up bomber and injured crewmen aboard. Randall Jarrell, an 8th Air Force Airman, wrote a poem that captured all the horror and intensity he and his fellow Flying Fortress crews faced in a piece titled, The Death of a Ball Turret Gun. From my mother's sleep, I fell into the state, and I hunched in its belly till my wet fur froze. Six miles from Earth, loosed from its dream of life, I woke to black flack in the nightmare fighters when I died, they washed me out of the turret with a hose. Such losses had a profound effect on morale and on the emotional health of the remaining B-17 crews. With buddies going down on every mission, the men became fatalistic. They clung to good luck charms and became increasingly superstitious. Others gradually lost their combat edge as battle exhaustion wore them out. In some cases, men broke down entirely and became psychiatric casualties. About 4% of all 8th Air Force losses in World War II were psychiatric cases. These were men who performed their duty admirably until the stress and strain of constant combat finally broke their emotional back. Such men were called flak happy by their peers or said to have the Baca Wolf jitters. During the war, the 8th Air Force suffered 50,000, roughly 50,000 KIA, WIA, and MIA. Uh, tremendous amount of guys lost their lives or were physically injured. But also, as the stress and strain of combat began to manifest themselves on these crews, it became clear that the 8th Air Force was going to have to do something 
about psychiatric casualties. They were starting to lose crews, starting to lose pilots, starting to lose gunners to emotional trauma. And so one of the things that the, uh, the Eighth Air Force did was they set up a series of rest homes for crews that had been through particularly horrendous ordeals. Or later on in the war, they were sent there just as a matter of course. These were called uh, uh, flak leaves, and they'd go back to these uh, country manors way out of the way from any uh, military installations, and they would be able to eat and relax. And that actually helped uh, get some of the uh, uh, emotional problems uh, that the crews were suffering uh, under control. Uh, now, this never threatened operations for the 8th Air Force. It was always a very small number of the uh, the crews. Uh, wartime reports had it that uh, uh, of every thousand men that flew combat with the 8th Air Force, 42 were going to become uh, psychiatric casualties of one sort or another. And they were, they were called permanent psychiatric cases if they were not returned to flight duty within 15 days. During the war, about 4,000 airmen and pilots fell into this category. Through these brutal months, the crews learned to love their B-17s. The Flying Fortress had a ruggedness that sometimes defied imagination. They came home with two, sometimes three engines knocked out and great gaping holes torn in their aluminum skins. Control shot away, landing gear ruined, hydraulics blown out, flaps gone and chunks of wing or tail hacked out by cannon shells didn't stop the rugged flying fortress. They came home limping, shattered and ruined, but still able to get their crews safely on the ground one final time. Hundreds of B-17s would return to England never to fly again. They would be dragged off to the boneyards where their broken bodies would be picked clean of spare parts that could be used to keep the other planes flying. To their crews, these faithful planes were utterly beloved. We've flown on two engines. But you're coming downhill, that makes a lot of difference. You don't have fuel, you don't have bombs, and you're coming downhill and you go long ways. But the old B-17 was a tough son of a gun. It can just get holes all over it, and it's still going to come back. The B-17 just had a great big old slab, and it flew real slow. <laughs> and it wasn't real high compression, so... So it could take a lot of punishment. One way the crews expressed their deep feelings toward their planes was through nose art. Nose art had, had some significance. It was a, a means to personalize a very impersonal weapon. A, a military aircraft is not a very personable, personal thing, especially when 12,000 of them just like it are flying around in the world. So this was their way, the crew's way, to put their unique stamp on their aircraft and make it their own. And once that happened, that aircraft ceased to become just a collection of metal bolts and welded pieces of aluminum. It became almost a living, breathing part of their, their uh, integrated crew. And so when you talk to crews who had their own aircraft for an extended period of time, they feel very, very strongly, very passionately towards that airplane, especially the B-17s that were so faithful and so rugged. Uh, and the, the crews will talk about their aircraft almost as if they were, they were people. With worn out crews and demoralized bomb groups, the 8th Air Force continued to attack targets in Germany even after the August 17th regensburg schweinfurt debacle. Post-war analysis later confirmed that the destruction at Regensburg cost the Germans some 1,000 ME-109s in lost production. What the Americans didn't realize was that the German aircraft industry was expanding at such a tremendous rate that those thousand planes were insignificant. Never once during the war did the Germans suffer from a lack of interceptors. In October of 1943, the 8th Air Force launched another concerted effort against targets in Germany. 
On October 8th, the B-17s bombed Bremen, losing 30 out of 399 planes. The next day, 36 more B-17s were lost attacking aircraft factories at Achlaum and Marienbad. The missions continued and the stress on the crews grew even worse. In one week, from October 2nd through the 9th, the Germans shot down or damaged beyond repair over 100 flying forts. The 8th Air Force lost almost a thousand men. And still, the worst was yet to come. On October 10th, the B-17 struck Munster. The Luftwaffe bored in on the bombers, concentrating on the low squadrons of the 100th Bomb Group. Flying a straggly, loose formation, the 100th turned out to be easy meat. Within minutes, the entire group was virtually wiped out. Hitting Munster cost another 36 B-17s and over 300 Americans. The lesson from Munster was clear. Flying in loose formations would get many men killed. There was one group that w flew pretty scraggly formations, yes, elements or formations. Uh, some of them consequently were hit harder than ours. Uh, our group flew good, tight formations. They wanted the wing of the side plane tucked right in behind the wing and in the waist of the other. In other words, tight elements of, of three. <clears throat> By having those wings all tucked in, concentrating the firepower uh, from all the guns aboard each ship, uh, it was a pretty good deterrent uh, that the Germans wouldn't come in too close and, and attack us. They liked to go after the disabled planes that had drifted off from them and got back here by themselves. I think one reason that our group didn't have the casualties that some of the groups, some of the squadrons, is we were a, a little knot up there in the sky. I could always spot our group. It was just, just tight. Then on October 14th, the crews assembled in the briefing rooms to learn they would be going after Schweinfurt once again. The news was received by a chorus of groans and shocked gasps amongst the exhausted crews. Still, they climbed aboard their B-17s to do their duty, knowing that today, many of them would not be coming home. They flew into a holocaust of flak and fighters. The Germans were waiting for them, and as soon as their short-ranged P-47 escorts turned for home, the 109s and 190s attacked. They swarmed through the B-17 formations, blasting the bombers out of the sky with cannons, rockets, and machine guns. Well, we were going into the ball bearing plant at Swineford, and uh, it was pretty tough going. Heavy flak, being shot at from every direction. And uh, I don't really know what happened, except some of the people in our squadron that saw us get shot down. But they said one of them rockets shot us. It was obviously a lost cause, and the uh, pilot was losing it, and so they jump out, and I had uh, the last shot that they hit us with, had the concussion had blown me back against the bulkhead, and uh, unplugged my oxygen and my intercom system. And I was a little while, when I finally come to, I realized I didn't uh, hear anybody and my oxygen thing wasn't moving. And so we were only 18,000 feet that day. So I went back to the cockpit and I was the only guy on that airplane. Everybody else had jump out. And so I run back and snap my parachute on and jump out. They had this big thing that they'd been trying to Stop was the Germans were shooting Americans in parachutes and the Americans were shooting Germans in parachutes and both sides were trying to stop it and uh, here come two ME 109s right at me they kept getting closer and closer when they got almost up to me they'd rear up like that 
and circled right tight around me, and both of them saluted. So I saluted, and they went away. And so I just landed in second growth timber, and was no harder than jumping off the bed. As the raid drove deeper into Germany, the Luftwaffe responded by throwing everything that could fly into the air at them. Even obsolete Ju-87 Stukas attacked the P-17s, dropping aerial bombs into their tight formations. One bomb group, the 305th, lost 12 planes out of its 27 before even reaching the target area. Those B-17s that reached Schweinfurt dropped their bombs as best they could through a growing pall of smoke that partially obscured the ball bearing factors. Entire groups missed their targets and their bombs fell all over the countryside. So many German fighters had attacked the flying forts that most of the American gunners were now running out of ammunition. Meanwhile, the German 109 and 190 squadrons were able to land to rearm and refuel in time to attack the bombers again. Low on ammo, the desperate bomber crews turned for home and endured hour after hour of deadly fighter attack and heavy flak. By the time they reached home, the surviving crews were burnt out and beyond the breaking point. Of the 229 B-17s sent out that day, 60 were shot down, 7 were written off, and 138 more were damaged. Over 630 men, the Mighty Eighth, were either killed, wounded, or captured. In two weeks of operations that October, the 8th Air Force had lost over 200 bombers, nearly half its total force. Worse, there was little to show for the terrible casualties. Something had to be done or the Germans would win the air war. The Army Air Corps had learned its lesson. It was time to throw the pre-war book away and figure out a new way to hit the Germans. The war would not be won with a quick knockout blow against Germany's wartime industries. Rather, it would take a long, sustained campaign to meet 8th Air Force's objectives. And to sustain such an operation, the bombers would need long-range fighter escort. Well, initially, the 8th Air Force only had P-47 groups available. And they had a very limited range. They could only get to just about the German frontier and back. Uh, so they were not able to escort the bombers all the way to target. That posed an increasing problem as the Luftwaffe caused more and more casualties to the 8th Bomber Command. So during the summer of 1943, the 8th Air Force began investigating the use of drop tanks, uh, external fuel tanks that could be slung underneath the fuselage and the wings of their P-47s. So they got uh, uh, very large fuel tanks, up to 108 gallon tanks, I believe, is, is among the ones that they used. And that was actually able to extend the P-47's radius of action by 100 miles. So they were able to actually go inside Germany uh, and actually could get 375 miles out from, from England and back. So that had a major effect on, uh, on the air war because the, the P-47s now didn't have to just turn around over Belgium. They could actually tangle with the Luftwaffe over Germany. But at the same time, after the Schweinfurt, second Schweinfurt raid, the uh, Eighth Air Force began demanding uh, long-range fighters. And of course, the only one that was available at the time was the P-38. So in October of 43, the very first P-38s began escorting the bombers, and while they were not as effective as uh, the P-47 or later the P-51, the 38s could at least provide some protection for the bombers, and they could actually go to Berlin and back. With winter closing in, the 8th Air Force flew less frequently in the final two months of 1943. When it did, it confined its attacks mainly to targets outside of Germany. The B-17s would wait for better weather. In the meantime, the 8th Air Force would get new leadership and they would change America's approach to the air war. In October, General Carl Spatz took over command of all strategic bombing operations in Europe. He at once realized that the only way to win the air war was to drive the Luftwaffe out of the sky. The flying fortresses had become bait. At the end of February 1944, a five-day break in the winter weather allowed the 8th Air Force to launch attacks deep into Germany against aircraft factories and airfields. 
The Luftwaffe rose to the defense and waded into the bomber stream with a vengeance. But then the Lightnings, Thunderbolts, and Mustangs protecting the B-17s pounced on the Germans, savaging their ranks. While the bombers took heavy losses, the Luftwaffe's interceptor units were badly mauled during the week-long battle. Two weeks later, the 8th Air Force went after Berlin. On the 6th of March, the Germans managed to down 69 B-17s over Berlin. In doing so, however, the Luftwaffe broke its own back. As they desperately tried to defend the Nazi capital, the 109s and 190s were set upon by American fighters and blasted from the sky. On March 8th, the B-17s returned to Berlin and once again a violent battle raged. When it was over, the German interceptor force had been crippled. Somebody yelled, Lightnings! And I looked around, my gosh, then I saw the lightnings. And they came down and all of a sudden I saw streamers go by. I said, oh boy, somebody's at my tail. And I went a little lower and by that time I heard a loud bang, and he had uh, cut off part of the right wing, and I just cut it and instinctively put her down. When the 8th Air Force returned to Berlin the next day, hardly a German fighter was seen, much to the delight of the bomber crews. For the next three months, the battle of attrition played out in all its bloody finality. The Germans lost more pilots than they could possibly replace, while the American units were reinforced regularly and never suffered from a shortage of crews. It was a race to see which side would die faster and which side would run out of warm bodies to throw into the fray. It was a race the Germans could not win. From big week to the end of May 1944, the Luftwaffe lost 28 of its top aces. During big week alone, the Luftwaffe lost 33% of its fighter force and 17.9% of its pilots defending the Reich. March proved even worse for the Germans as they lost fully 56% of their fighter aircraft and 22% of their remaining pilots while trying to defend Berlin. Such casualties could not be sustained. The Germans started the year with 2,283 available fighter pilots. By May, 2,262 had been killed or wounded, a 99% loss rate. The Luftwaffe was being bled white, and it was the 8th Air Force that was causing the bleeding. While Allied fighters blasted the Luftwaffe from the sky, the bombers still had targets to hit. Former B-17 crewman Les Hardy takes us on a typical mission deep within the heart of the third wake. They'd wake you up probably one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning and uh, run you down for chow, breakfast, and uh, we didn't get eggs. Somewhere I read that on a combat day you got real eggs. That they missed us. We got those powdered eggs, but the cooks did a good job on them. And then by the time you went through briefing and got your flying gear on, your heated suits, you had to wear heated suits, or you'd freeze to death up there. And uh, then assembled out at your airplane and got the information from your officers if they had anything. The navigator would usually tell us what the weather was supposed to be over the target. And uh, then we'd form up over England, which was quite often dangerous because it might be, uh, it might be going through clouds. It was, it was very foggy, they didn't even attempt it, but it, it wasn't unusual to have air-to-air -air collisions while you were forming up. But eventually we'd get formed up and in formation head across the channel and uh, you were stuck in that airplane for quite a few hours when you went to Berlin. No, uh, 
nothing to eat. I think they gave us a candy bar. One time they gave us an orange. <laughs> that works real good at 28,000 feet, 60 below. We could have thrown those at the enemy. Getting to Berlin, quite often we encountered flak because they had their 88s mounted on rail cars and trucks and they moved them around and I swear they knew where we were, what our flight pattern was. Because quite often we'd get flak on the way and you just, you didn't dodge around it. You had to stay on your course. But as you approach Berlin, if some other group was ahead of you, the air was black with flak and that's what you had to fly through. On the bomb run, uh, the uh, bombardier, the pilot turned the thing on autopilot, so the bombardier controls the airplane on the flight over the target, because he's the one that's aiming the sperry at the ground. And so he just flew through that like that was the only way to go. And it was very exciting. I'd like to have been able to shoot at something but of course, I couldn't do that. I could see plenty good through the top of my radio shack. It was wide open. The two little windows on the side weren't very good for seeing things, but I could see enough. Probably all I wanted to. With the Luftwaffe on its knees, the 8th Air Force turned its attention to supporting the D-Day invasion and subsequent campaign in Normandy. The flying fortresses hit coastal emplacements and other targets along the beaches just prior to the landings, then took part in carpet bombing operations against German troops. One such mission virtually destroyed the German Panzer Lehr Division in July of 1944 and helped pave the way for the American breakout from the beachhead. Once the Allied armies broke out of Normandy and began driving toward Germany, the 8th Air Force turned to new targets in hopes of shortening the war. Up until early September of 1944, the heavy bombers had mainly attacked aircraft factories, U-boat assembly plants or pens, docks, and ball-bearing factories. In May, the bombers had begun hitting oil refineries and synthetic fuel plants. D-Day delayed hitting any more of these targets until the fall of 1944, but in September, the mighty 8th returned to Germany and systematically destroyed the Reich's ability to process fuel. The attacks were an incredible success. By December, the 8th Air Force had knocked out almost half of Germany's refineries, precipitating a fuel crisis within the German army. Just when the Wehrmacht needed mobility the most, its panzers ground to a halt for want of oil and gas. Desperate measures were tried to get around this problem, including the construction of charcoal-burning engines that tanks could use, but they were too little, too late. The Flying Fortress had at last delivered the knockout punch the pre-war bomber advocates fervently believed it could do. At the same time, the 8th's bombers were used to attack marshalling yards and rail centers throughout Germany. Mainly, most of my missions in those days were the marshalling yards. We were trying to um, destroy the transportation system so they couldn't move anything around by train. And uh, it, we did. We really destroyed the area because later on when I went to Germany, it took me five days to go on train because they had to go all over the place because they had to go where the tracks were still left. But that was mainly what we were doing at the end of the war is bombing the tracks, train tracks, marshalling yards, destroying any moving stock. By the end of the war, most of everything that the Germans had was, being, was already destroyed. It was really destroyed. The destruction of the Reich's rail net proved to be one of the Flying Fortress's most significant contributions to the war effort. German industry depended on the railroads to deliver raw materials and carry away finished products. By late 1944, the railroad system had all but collapsed under the weight of B-17-borne bombs. Even the barest necessities could not be transported effectively via rail by the end of 1944. 
coal in the lifeblood of German industry piled up near the mines with no way to get it to the factories that so badly needed it. By January, this caused a full-scale collapse of the German economy. And still, even as Nazi Germany twisted in its death throes, the B-17 crews continued to take heavy losses. No longer were German interceptors much of a threat. With thousands of bombers and thousands of fighters ranging across the Reich, the Luftwaffe had been all but swept from the skies. Flak, however, was a different matter entirely. The Germans concentrated hundreds of anti-aircraft batteries around crucial oil targets until some factories were defended by over a thousand heavy guns. Using radar guidance, late war German anti-aircraft fire brought down thousands of American aircraft, fighters, medium bombers, and even the high-flying B-17s. There was another air raid in the afternoon, and here came the 8th American Air Force. I think it was a multi-effort because I think I counted over 90 planes or 100 planes, B-17s and the German aircraft artillery apparently had them just right. All of a sudden I saw one bomber blow up and nine parachute, parachutes and another one. And at one time I counted 27 parachutes. Flak became the worst menace the B-17 crews faced. Our biggest fear uh, was the Flak, because when I got there, uh, we were really making strides on the ground and we were pushing the, the, uh, the Germans back, which time they're bringing all their Flak guns back and concentrating them in, in the cities. So when we started into a target and you looked up ahead, uh, it looked like a piece of white paper with a drop of ink drops down all over the paper. It was just a massive airspace of black flak burrs. And we were losing a lot of planes because of that, too. It was a milk run, which is supposed to be an easy mission, just across the channel to uh, a Luftwaffe airfield in uh, Pretty sure it was France. Now, it could have been Belgium, but hard to remember. Anyhow, three airplanes. It was a big mission. And we went storming over there. I think we even left at a decent time in the morning. And uh, as they say, a milk run, that means you're not supposed to have any trouble. Well, we didn't until we got over the target on our bomb run, and they cut loose with very accurate anti-aircraft fire and a little plastered stuff all over us. We were flying on number two spot, we were playing on the starboard side of the bus. Took a hit, must have been oxygen tanks. And something got fire, and of course, fueled by oxygen, it's a holocaust. Well, we could see the guys, some of them bailing out. I can't remember how many shoots we saw. But we wouldn't really re impressed me. This plane kept flying right along beside us. And the pilot, who I had flown a practice mission with, tall, slim guy, real tall, he crawled out the pilot window because of the fire. I'm sure he couldn't get out. I don't know how a guy even got through that pilot window. And reached inside and got his parachute, chest, chest back, and slid off of the wing. And I didn't know whether he got his chute on or not. In fact, it was reported that he did not. Later, well, a year or so later, I found out he had made it to the ground and no problem. It was unbelievable. I couldn't register what I had seen or hadn't seen. We had our wingman right opposite us. Uh, we were in the target area and hadn't been hit ourselves. And all of a sudden, there was something that caught my attention on, on our right side. Looked over there, and the plane that was supposed to have been there wasn't there anymore. Uh, I looked around to see, well, maybe it went up a little higher. And I looked backwards, and there wasn't any behind. I looked down, and I couldn't find that plane's position. And I looked again, and I could see parts of the plane falling and gotten a direct hit. I guess it must have been the whole charge or two from ACAC. 
must have hit him right in the, blew him up. Uh, that was, you know, that, there it was and there it wasn't. I don't think there was a soul probably got out of that plane. By the end of the war, over 12,000 B-17s had been produced. The B-17G, with its additional twin-gun chin turret, was the most numerous version, with 8,680 being built. For decades, historians have argued the pros and cons of the strategic bombing campaign in Europe. All agree that the B-17 didn't win the war against Germany alone, as the bombing advocates had theorized before the war, but the B-17 still played a key role in the victory over Hitler. The bombers wrecked Germany's oil industry, ensuring the defeat of the Wehrmacht by the Allied armies. More importantly, however, the B-17s drew out the Luftwaffe in the spring of 1944 during Big Week and the Berlin Raids. In doing so, the bombers helped achieve complete air superiority over Western Europe as the German interceptor force ruined itself defending Berlin from the thousands of flying fortresses and the fighters the 8th Air Force was able to put into the air. This bloody victory set the stage for the Normandy invasion. For had the Allies not had complete control of the air, D-Day might never have taken place. When the war ended in Europe, the B-17's heyday came to an end. By 1945, the Flying Fortress was a 10-year-old design. Rugged, tough, and always a warrior, the B-17 nevertheless could not survive in a world that would soon see jet fighters, atomic weapons, and guided missiles. The 8th Air Force's 2,000 B-17s were collected together in fields all over England, where they were either flown back to the United States or scrapped on site and thus the B-17's last contribution may have been its most significant. These majestic planes were melted down and their metal used to help rebuild Western Europe. The destruction they had once wrought was repaired by their very skins, a noble end in view. Today only a few B-17s exist to remind future generations of the air war that raged so many years ago each flying fortress is a treasure. They remain lonely signposts of the struggle that once raged in the bloody skies of Europe. Battles on land leave scars in the earth to mark their passage into history, but the sky over Europe reveals no secrets and tells no tales. The sky remains unchanged, unchangeable, as it had for the eons prior to those black-torn years of World War II. In these skies, titans once clashed. An epic struggle for survival unfolded amidst these clouds with stakes so high, entire nations would be destroyed. Young men by the hundreds of thousands were flung into the maelstrom of this desperate battle as the fighting reached its bitter climax. Over 60,000 young Americans and Germans would never return home their lives snuffed out in the air over Nazi-held Europe. In the end, through their courage to clamber aboard their faithful B-17s for mission after mission, these men of the mighty 8th Air Force helped free Europe from the dark tyranny of Hitler's Germany. Their legacy of freedom and of peace will never be forgotten.
Aviation, the art of aeronautics, began with the dreamers, inventors, and daredevils who dared to defy gravity. The journey of aviation was nurtured by pioneers like the Wright brothers, whose first flight marked a historic milestone. The role of aircrafts in world wars was groundbreaking, dramatically changing warfare strategies. This initiated a technological evolution in aviation, transforming the simplistic wings of a biplane into the thunderous roar of jet engines. Let's journey through the ages of aviation. Behind every great aircraft, there were great minds. These visionaries, like Sir Frank Whittle, the innovator of the turbojet engine, redefined air travel. Then there's Skunk Works' Kelly Johnson, the genius behind the SR-71 Blackbird. His designs combined speed, stealth and power, crafting machines that dominated the heavens. The contributions of these pioneers have left an indelible mark on the canvas of aviation, shaping the course of history and inspiring generations of engineers and aviators. Each epoch in aviation history gave birth to extraordinary aircrafts, each with their own unique features and roles. The Lockheed SR-71 Blackbird was a marvel of speed and stealth. The F-105 Thunderchief, a supersonic fighter bomber, was vital in the Vietnam War. The P-51 Mustang, a long-range fighter, was critical in World War II. The P-47 Thunderbolt, a heavyweight fighter, was used extensively in the same war. The A-10 Thunderbolt II, the Warthog, is a close air support icon. The Messerschmitt ME262 marked a leap forward in aviation technology. Each of these game changers were instrumental in their eras and their legacies still resonate today. Beyond the game changers, there are those that have transcended their practical roles to become icons. The Concorde was not just an aircraft, it was a supersonic symbol of luxury and speed. The B-52 Stratofortress, a strategic bomber, is an icon of power and resilience. These magnificent machines and others like them have become much more than just aircrafts. They are enduring icons that encapsulate the audacious spirit, the relentless innovation and the boundless ambition that define the world of aviation. For more amazing aerial footage and to join us in this incredible journey, check out the Dronescape's YouTube channel. If you enjoyed this video, please remember to like and subscribe. And as always, thank you for watching.